Hello, I'm Kyle Clark from Beta Technologies and I'm excited to be here at the Sea Change Sessions where we can start saving our winters so we don't have to ski things like this. Alright, welcome inside here at Beta Technologies where we are uh, developing electric aviation systems to help turn the corner on climate change. I personally think that Turning the corner on climate change is the call to action for our generation. And this contribution we're making through electric aviation is really important. The adoption of electric aviation is enabled by high energy density batteries and high power density motors. Scooters, cars, trucks, even boats are going electric. And presently, airlines have really no solution to reduce their, meaningfully reduce their contribution to carbon emissions. So what we've developed here is an aircraft we call a LEA. It's got a 50 foot wingspan, it's a big aircraft, and it's got four rotors on the top that are powered by direct drive electric motors. And on the tail, it's got a single motor. And the way it works is these top rotors spin. This takes off vertically from any place from a distribution center, from a hospital, from an urban environment, from a suburban environment. Once it gets up in the air, this rear rotor turns on, and it's a super efficient electric motor as well, and pushes this forward. Once it gets enough speed, the wing takes over the lifting portion, and these rotors stow in this super aerodynamic position, almost like javelins flying through the sky and the aircraft cruises very, very efficiently to its destination. As it slows down, these top rotors turn back on and it lands vertically. And that may not seem initially as super important to efficiency, but to our customers, it's a big deal. So for example, if you're a shipper and you have to take packages from a distribution center, load it up on a truck, bring that truck to the airport, unload it from the truck at the airport, into an airplane sitting by the runway that's burning jet fuel ready to go, get it all loaded up, taxi out to the runway, take off, go to where you're going, unload it into another truck, and then bring it to a distribution center for its destination. There's three different vehicles all burning fuel going convoluted, less than direct routes. With this aircraft, taking off and landing vertically enables the shipper to go distribution center to distribution center. And that's a huge savings in their operations, which enables the commercial adoption and naturally a huge energy savings because you're just traveling less distance and less time. So how do we go about doing this while being respectful to our environment and, and helping to meet our mission as a business? Well, one way is we're very cognizant of the things that may negatively affect the efforts that we're making to turn the corner in climate change. Number one is the contribution of lithium ion batteries. Lead acid batteries are big, they're bulky, but they're 99% recyclable, which is really neat. They take the lead, they take the plastic, they take the lead oxide. They recycle everything except for the label on the battery. It's really a wonderful thing. Problem is we can't use lead acid batteries in aviation. Their specific energy density, the amount of energy they carry per weight just doesn't support flight. So we have to use advanced technologies like lithium ion. Lithium ion ba batteries have only been around for about 20 years. The recycling infrastructure, the chemistry, the methodologies are really not that mature. So we at Beta took a, a different approach. We asked, how do we look at this from a holistic life cycle perspective? And the answer is, let's find a second life for the batteries that solves another problem. So interestingly enough, the batteries are used through about 1500 cycles, maybe a year and a half of operation every day, flying packages, medicine, people. And when the batteries degrade about 8% from their beginning of life capacity, we take them out of the airplane. And what do we do with it? Do we show them, shove them into a chemical vat to, uh, to recycle them? No, there's still a lot of useful life in those batteries. So the way that we, we use them is we use them in grid tied applications. And the neat part is it solves two problems. Pointing at the grid, it allows those batteries to provide an arbitrage function for the volatility of renewable injections from solar and wind. So our, what we call a four quadrant power converter, something that can push power on the grid and take power off the grid in both the real and the reactive domains, provides frequency and voltage support 
by supporting the grid with renewable assets on it. Meanwhile, that arbitrage sits right next to an aircraft recharging pad like we have here in Burlington. Those batteries trickle charge all day long, so they don't bump the grid with these peaky loads the way that EVs do when everybody gets home at five o'clock and plugs them in. They trickle charge all day long, and when the airplane lands, the energy in that arbitrage, which again are reused aircraft batteries, gets sloshed over to the aircraft so that we recharge it very quickly, to recharge it in minutes. But the grid never sees that. The grid only sees this really gentle trickle charge and that support of renewable energy. So we took a problem of how do we reuse or recycle the batteries? We said, let's reuse them on the grid. Not only do our customers get a fast recharge, so they get to adopt this zero carbon emission technology, the renewable resources get a bump and our penetration can go up and we get to reuse the batteries and we can monetize them as well. Which of course, as we all know, one of the important parts of adopting technologies for climate change is to make them commercially viable first. The interesting thing about this specific technology is that the barriers to entry through certification and the regulatory challenges and even customer adoption are very, very high. Because they're so high, there's a bow wave of technology that's just waiting to get adopted into aviation. And we're crossing that chasm, bringing it to aviation. And the neat thing is Bill Gates talks about the green premium. We actually have the opposite of the green premium. Our customers are finding that using electric aviation in their fleets and in their applications is first and foremost commercially viable. Therefore, they can adopt it in scale. That's a big deal for them. Their operations benefit, as we talked about before, because they now have three to five handling points reduced to two with direct operation point to point. And electric propulsion enables that. And number three, they get to meet their sustainability goals. As you all know, Amazon has a goal of going net zero by 2040. UPS is on that track as well. There's a number of logistics companies who find it really important to reduce their dent on the environment. In fact, UPS, they're the second largest fuel consumer in the US. So a meaningful dent can only be made when we attack these big, big buckets, not these niche, th niche things. And, and to attack those big buckets, we have to offer something that's first, commercially viable, second, improves operations, and third, is sustainable. And that sustainability is a really important part of what we do. So that's the story on the batteries. Secondly, those recharging centers, those recharging centers are actually built out of second use containers. Those second use containers, we have a surplus here in North America because the imbalance, the trade imbalance from Asia right now. Those containers sometimes sit in a port and rot. Sometimes they get sent back to Asia empty, which is expensive shipping for nothing. But we, we said, hey, let's, let's consume those. They're great containers for this type of work. And, and to, to adopt electric aviation or electric vehicles or electric marine, it's not a one and done. We don't all of a sudden drop in the infrastructure day one and it gets used. It's a progressive thing. We have to have a modular substru substructure that we can, we can deploy to the grid in bite-sized pieces. So there's maybe 10 routes the first year, 100 routes the next year, 2,000 right, routes the third year, 5,000 routes the fifth year. As we grow those, the energy storage, the recharging infrastructure, and of course the airplanes, which are inherently modular because they're units, has to grow with it. So these reused containers gives us the ability to deploy these things at the right scale, at the right place, and that modularity is very important. So systems thinking is a really important part of how we're able to actually bring this technology to the forefront. So another couple important things about this specific aircraft are the materials that are used and the technologies that are used in it. So for example, to the extent possible, we use composites that are recyclable. One of the great things about automobiles is they're substantially steel. That steel can be recycled. They can be stripped of their polymers. They, the aluminums can come off, the engine block can come out, and they can recycle the steel. With what we call plastic airplanes that have a polymer composite matrix, and then may, many cases carbon fiber, it's really difficult to recycle that. So to the extent possible, we use, we use 
thermoplastics, thermoplastic composites that actually can be reground and reused. Thermoplastics can be melted and reused numerous times. Thermoset polymers can't necessarily be, be recycled in the same way. So you'll see pervasive use of those, those materials in our aircraft. The second important thing that I think people forget about are the auxiliary fluids that are used in aerospace, hydraulic fuel, fluids, oils, cooling, coolants, lubricants. And these things, once they're used in the aircraft, they're taken out. And in many cases, they're recycled. In many cases, they're not, unfortunately. So going to an aircraft that not only goes from ethylene to polypropylene glycol, that would be a nice step, but we actually take all of that liquid cooling out of the airplane completely. All of these motors are air cooled. Now that takes a little more investment on the front end in engineering and thermal management and the way we route things. But for the 20 year life of the aircraft, you're not replacing fluids that have chemicals in them at every overhaul or every service interval. The same thing's true with the lubrication throughout the aircraft, oil lubrication versus grease lubrication. Grease lubri lubrication consumes much less than, than an oil lubrication that needs to be replaced. So the use of, of recyclable composite materials, the omission of all liquid cooling in the aircraft, gives us a couple benefits. Obviously there's the environmental one. So for our customers, the service intervals are longer. A longer duration between service intervals means that our customers have greater uptime, which means they need less airplanes. Less airplanes means less materials, less energy, less waste, less parking, all of that reduction in waste makes this an adoptable technology for our customers. And that's, of course, really, really critical for us to, to deploy these things in mass. Another really important part about um, the adoption of, of electric aviation is quenching the fears around range anxiety. When we, when we get out flying an airplane in bad weather and the controller doesn't give us optimal routing and the winds pick up from the wrong direction they're always from the wrong direction and we end up in a situation where we don't have as much energy and enough margin to really feel comfortable flying this plane for for a whole lot of missions we're going to reduce the adoption of the technology so this aircraft is a is a physically large aircraft a very large aircraft it's got 50 feet of wings and in the belly here, there's 3,000 pounds of batteries. Half the mass of the aircraft is in batteries. And that gives us an, an exceptional range of 250 nautical miles. That range is not important because people are going 250 nautical miles. That range is really important because when they go 100 nautical miles and the wind picks up, and it's not uncommon to fly here westerly and have a 50 knot wind on the nose. And then to get where you're going, and not be able to get the optimal routing into your landing spot. So, so this, this surplus of energy allows our customers to say, yeah, we're confident putting people, cargo, organs, tissues on the aircraft and sending it westerly. That, that's a important philosophy that I think forget, gets forgotten about a lot of times in, in new technology adoption. Everybody imagines how you may fly an airplane. You've got a range, you've got a mission to go, and everything goes honky-dory according to plan. The wind doesn't change, the, uh, the icing doesn't start, but in our philosophies, being real operators of airplanes, we realize that we've got to make an aircraft that can meet all of those goals before it gets adopted in mass. So here at Beta Technologies, we're developing an electric aircraft system. It includes the aircraft, the recharging, the training, thoughtfulness and mindfulness about how we go about incorporating technologies to the aircraft such that over the 20 year life of the aircraft, it is sustainable to our customers, it's sustainable to our environment, and we make a meaningful dent in turning the corner of climate change. Presently, aviation is 9% of the CO2 emissions from transportation, and we have solutions in electric cars and electric buses, trucks, marine, and so aviation is growing and growing and growing. And if we at Beta and others don't do anything about this, aviation will be the largest contributor by, 2020, by 2035 to carbon emissions in the sector of transportation. So this is really important work that we're doing and we're doing it, and I believe, in a thoughtful way that both our customers appreciate and, uh, and, and the planet appreciates. Thanks again for having me here at the Sea Change Sessions, and I hope together we can turn the corner on climate change.